right. Hello, everybody out there. It's great to be with you all today. My name is John Lustria. I'm the Director of Education at the National Museum of Civil War Medicine and thrilled to be joined today by our uh, recurring guest, uh, one of our excellent docents here at the museum, Brad Stone. Thanks for coming back, Brad. Bonjour. Uh, it's great to be here. I'm excited to talk about uh, our subject matter, which is uh, French influence in the Civil War. Exactly. Bonjour is the word of the day. Um, so bonjour to all of you out there watching. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we, we appreciate folks tuning in week in and week out uh, for our videos. So uh, that's great news. If you have any questions today, uh, go ahead and drop them in the comments and we'll get to them at the end of the program. Uh, if you like our videos, go ahead and press the like button and uh, share them and tell your friends about the videos and, and all that good stuff. That's an easy, free way to support the museum. It helps us out quite a bit. If you want to take your support to the next level, uh, consider becoming a member of the National Museum of Civil War Medicine. Uh, memberships start as low as $25, get you free admission to the museum for a year and uh, discounts in the gift shop and all sorts of other really wonderful things. We'd love to have you join on if you haven't. It's a great way to help support our programming. And we would, uh, like I said, really appreciate it. And if you become a member, you'll get the opportunity to see Brad this weekend at the museum, uh, which uh, if you're watching this after the date of the live stream, you may have already missed it. But since you're watching it as we're live right now, uh, you all, We'll have the chance to see Brad this weekend if you become a member, uh, come and see him for free. He'll be in the conference room uh, with talking about Civil War surgery on uh, Sunday, February, uh, what is that, 13, Brad? I believe that's the case. It coincides with another uh, rather important day. Uh, I think it's called uh, the Super Bowl. Exactly. So I can't think of a better way to spend Super Bowl Sunday. Uh, get a little fix of uh, Civil War surgery, Civil War medicine, and then uh, head home to watch the big game. So that will be splendid. So again, just to review, uh, if you like our videos, great ways to support us. Hit like, hit the like button on the video and hit the share button and tell your friends about us or become a member. With all that said, we'll go ahead and uh, get ready to jump into our topic today, uh, which as Brad said, is about the French influence on the American Civil War. So I'm gonna start a PowerPoint here shortly. At that point, I will no longer be able to see your questions or comments. So if I'm not responding to you, that's because I'm, I'm not able to see them. We won't be able to see them till the end. So please drop your questions and comments in there and we'll make sure to circle around to as many as we can before the program is over. All right, there we are. All right, take it away, Brad. Oh, thank you, John. Uh, yeah, I'm very happy to be talking about this uh, not very well-known aspect of the Civil War, and that is the enormous role that the French played uh, directly and indirectly, intentionally and uh, non-intentionally in terms of the Civil War. And I think it's something that's important to note because a lot of people have the misconception that the Civil War was just sort of an internal struggle, uh, kind of fought in a vacuum, uh, but the opposite was true. It had enormous international implications. Nations throughout the world were very keenly interested in the Civil War, its outcome and how it may affect them. And indeed, a lot of nations, including France, uh, tried to varying degrees to influence the outcome of the war. Uh, so their influence was extensive. And one of the reasons I'm dressed the way I am today um, is that, uh, you know, it, it, e even things like uniforms were affected by the, uh, by the uh, French. But uh, we'll begin with the next slide, please. So um, the influence of the French uh, is so extensive that I couldn't possibly go into all of it today. But I am going to hit some of the highlights of it. And that includes things like 
uh, their influence on the way the war was conducted, the military aspect of it. Uh, medicine, how French medicine inspired improvements in American medicine. The geopolitical factors that uh, governed how the Confederates, uh, pardon me, the French, um, viewed both the Confederacy and the Union, how French nationals, French immigrants, and French Americans served as combatants for both sides of the Civil War and indeed served in, in leadership positions for both sides of the Civil War. Um, it is also not very well known uh, that France was actually a site of a major battle of the Civil War. And finally, I'm going to talk about some of the enduring symbols of the relationship between France and the United States that came out of the Civil War. Next slide, please. So um, one of the um, big factors in the military um, uh, way the war was conducted was Napoleon and the tactics he developed, uh, which are known as Napoleonic tactics that were widely uh, studied by uh, people throughout the war. If you went to a military academy, including those in the United States, places like West Point, you would have studied Napoleonic tactics extensively. And basically, uh, they involved the maneuvering of close formations of men across the battlefield. Um, most of the military leaders in both the North and the South who had gone to West Point or other military academies were very well trained in Napoleonic tactics and would utilize them through much of the Civil War. Now, Unfortunately, in the years or decades between the Napoleonic Wars and the Civil War, there were tremendous changes in military technology. And those changes rendered the Civil War a far, far bloodier and uh, more destructive place than many of the Napoleonic Wars. One of the big factors was the widespread introduction of rifled muskets. These muskets had rifled barrels, which allowed them to shoot far further and more accurately than their smoothbore musket counterparts of the Napoleonic War. Now, one thing that made them even far more lethal was a new type of ammunition that was developed shortly before the Civil War. It was developed by a French army officer by the name of Claude Manet. We refer to that um, ammunition as the mini ball. And um, I don't know if you can see me, but um, I'm holding one up here so you can get uh, an idea of its relative size. Uh, you also see a picture of it there. This bullet was particularly destructive. It is a very large bullet by today's standards. It was uh, basically a hollow piece of lead. And when it hit, it caused enormous damage. If it didn't kill you outright, it would uh, shatter bone, tear apart tissue, and many times these wounds would cause uh, or necessitate uh, amputations. So to give you an idea of how destruction, the destructive this combination of the mini ball and the rifled musket is, um, it accounts for about 90% of the more than 200,000 uh, deaths during the Civil War on the battlefield. It also accounts for about 90% of the uh, wounds, 400,000 wounds that were incurred on the battlefield of the Civil War. Next, please. So in view of this carnage, uh, the American medical system or lack thereof uh, badly needed um, the, the uh, influence of French advances in medicine on a number of fronts. First of all, uh, leading up to the Civil War, in many ways, America is kind of a backward nation, uh, particularly in terms of the qualifications of many of its surgeons and the standards of many of its medical schools. Um, some American medical schools were, were excellent. Many were not. Um, and many of those who sought the best medical education would go to Europe. And, and France was particularly renowned for its excellent 
medical schools, particularly the Paris School of Medicine. One of the things that made these me medical schools stand out is unlike many American medical schools, they allowed widespread access uh, to cadavers for their students. They also train their students in the latest medical technology, the use of thermometers, the stethoscope, which was invented by a French surgeon, microscopes, and uh, curriculum in hygiene. All these made them cutting edge and going into the Civil War, and particularly through the Civil War, there is a very big movement in the United States to get American medical schools up to the standards of their French counterparts. Now, one of the most important things that the French did was provided um, guidance on the treatment of the battlefield wounded. Indeed, it was French army surgeon Dominique Jean Loret during the Napoleonic Wars, who really developed some of the first systems for treating battlefield wounded during a battle. Prior to him, it was very often the practice not to take the wounded off the battlefield until after the battle. He changed that. He developed systems for getting them off in real time and getting them to nearby medical help. He also developed one of the first systems for prioritizing the treatment of the wounded. And this would later be refined and eventually become the system of triage we use today. He uh, his uh, innovations were eventually um, compiled into a, a, a system, a comprehensive system by famed Union Major Jonathan Letterman during the Civil War. That would create what was known as the Letterman system, which still serves as the foundation for modern mass casualty evacuation and treatment systems. And finally, one of the big influences of the French is dealing with one of the major killers of the Civil War. As we like to talk about the museum, the battlefield was not the primary killer during the Civil War. Basically for every one battle-related death of the Civil War, there were two that were due to disease and illness. And among the deadliest diseases was malaria. And the French took the lead in developing what was at the time the only effective treatment for malaria, which was quinine. In the 1820s, it was French scientists who purified uh, quinine for pharmaceutical development. And indeed, American manufacturers, pharmaceutical manufacturers, which were exclusively located in the North during that period, hired many French scientists to create the wherewithal to produce large scale production of quinine. When the Civil War broke up, broke out rather, these Northern pharmaceutical companies greatly benefited from this technology, were able to produce large scale amounts of quinine that were able to fully supply the Union Army throughout the war. The Confederacy, on the other hand, had uh, a much worse time of it because first of all, they couldn't get access to the raw material for quinine because of the Union blockade, and they had never developed the pharmaceutical capacity of the North. And therefore, throughout most of the war, they lacked adequate supplies of quinine. Next slide, please. Now, Turning to the ge geopolitical aspect of France's policies towards the North and the South, many at the beginning of the war, both in the Confederacy and in France, thought it was a very, very good likelihood that Napoleon III, who was the autocratic leader of France at the time, would have France intervene at least to some degree on behalf of the Confederate cause. First of all, Napoleon III had a visceral dislike of the United States. He had actually visited the United States before he became the ruler of France, didn't like what he saw. But like many Europeans, he also uh, disliked the United States because he thought we were getting too big for our britches, uh, that we had imperialist ambitions, particularly after the Mexican-American War. And he was delighted by the prospect that the United States may be torn asunder. Um, he also, ironically, uh, was um, um, in favor of a civil war because it suited his interest 
and his imperialist ambitions in establishing a puppet government in Mexico. This was under the leadership of Maximilian, Emperor of Mexico. Maximilian was actually an Austrian aristocrat, and he was seeking to overthrow the legitimate government of Mexican President Benito Juarez. Now, um, the French actually, uh, you know, uh, invaded Mexico with their troops, um, and they were fighting this battle with the Mexican throughout the course of the Civil War. And uh, the only way they were allowed to do it was because America uh, was embroiled in the Civil War. Despite that, though, the French had a very tough time of it. And one of the early indications of just how difficult their invasion was going to be was a very significant defeat of French forces by Mexican forces at the Battle of Puebla in May 5th of 1862. Now, if you were in Mexico, you would say that that battle was fought on Cinco de Mayo. And if we have the next slide, please. That's where we get the celebration of Cinco de Mayo. Uh, it is not Mexican Independence Day. Rather, it marks this very important battle. And it's not only an important battle for Mexico, it's also a very important battle for the Union. Lincoln and people throughout the Union were very hardened at the fact that the French had suffered such a significant defeat. Um, it was indirectly an enormous boost to the Union cause. Back to the other slide, please. Oh. There we go. Um, so as you can see, yeah, another example that the Civil War was by no means strictly an American affair. It had international repercussions. But now, uh, getting back to French attitudes towards the Civil War, another reason that they might intervene on behalf of the French, or pardon me, the Confederacy, is that France had the second biggest textile industry in Europe uh, at the eve of the Civil War. And they were very dependent, at least at that point, on Southern cotton. So for all these reasons, again, the Confederates are very hopeful that the French will actively intervene on their behalf. Next slide. And then the next slide. But if you looked a little deeper, there were other forces in France that um, argued against any kind of intervention. First of all, um, French Republicans, those committed to the uh, cause of democracy, look to America as a shining beacon of the promise of democracy. And they wanted the American experiment to succeed. And so they were very loyal to the Union cause, not only uh, in, on behalf of America itself, but because they harbored the hope that someday full democracy would return to France. Now, one big impediment to active French intervention on behalf of the Confederacy was the French um, foreign ministry. Um, the French foreign ministry, even Napoleon III's French uh, two foreign ministers, uh, his original one, uh, Edouard Trovenal, and Trovenal's successor, Edouard Jontaui, uh, were both very passionate advocates for a policy of strict neutrality on the war. And one of their major concerns was no matter how sympathetic uh, the French regime may be to the Confederacy and no, no matter how beneficial a Confederate victory might be for France, they very much feared that the Union would ultimately win. And if the Union did win, there'd be serious repercussions for any French intervention. Um, as the war goes on, these beliefs become stronger as the Union cause continues to do well uh, at, the pardon me, at the ballot box and on the battlefield. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, one of the other less important aspects is that when um, President Lincoln declares the Emancipation Proclamation, it does create a bit more of a political problem for any uh, French intervention on behalf of the South because now the issue of slavery has become involved in the struggle and France is committed to the cause of abolition. 
But one of the big factors that starts to weigh on the French foreign ministry's mind as the war goes on is they become increasingly suspicious that the Confederacy harbors a desire to invade Mexico should the Confederacy succeed in breaking off from the Union. And that would be in direct, um, you know, um, di direct opposition to what the French are planning to do in Mexico. Uh, and that, again, suspicion becomes stronger and stronger as the war goes on. So it can be said that certainly by at least the middle of the Civil War, the French ardor for getting involved on behalf of the Confederacy is greatly diminished. Next slide, please. One of the um, big factors in Southern attitudes toward France and vice versa uh, are the diplomatic skills of both the Confederacy and the French. And in this regard, um, the Confederacy is not very well served by its primary envoy to France. Uh, his name is John Slidell. And by all accounts, an excellent lawyer, a uh, very prominent one in the South before the war. Um, but he is largely unsuccessful in getting any of the objectives that France, or pardon me, the Confederacy wants to get from France. They don't get French recognition for the sovereignty of the Confederacy. They don't get any uh, substantial supply of arms from French sources. And they don't get any kind of military intervention um, by the French, even things like challenging the Union blockade. He basically fails to gain the confidence of, of the French and um, doesn't do a very good job in imparting any real insight for, for the Confederacy as to what's going on in the French government. Uh, in some cases, he's even counterproductive. He sometimes says things to the French that increase their suspicions about Confederate intentions, particularly on the subject of possibly going into Mexico. On the other hand, the French are very well served for the most part by their diplomats in the United States, in particular, their counsel to uh, Richmond, which at the time was the Confederate capital. His name is Alfred Paul. He's an incredible intellect and he is able to give the French very accurate analysis of what's going on in the war. And from the outset of the war, he concludes that the war is basically the Union's to lose, that the Union has overwhelming military and industrial might, and it will eventually win the war. The only thing that can prevent it from winning is if they lack the political will to do it. And so he uh, tells his, his foreign ministry to not you know, obsess on the outcome of individual battles or even military campaigns. He says, ignore those. What you really need to focus in on is whether Lincoln is able to continue his control of the union government. If he is, then they will undeniably win the war. And he wins over the French foreign ministry in that analysis and other parts of the French government as well. So by 1864, when Lincoln wins re-election, the French government begins a slow but discernible movement toward a more pro-union position. Next, please. Now, at the outset of the war, France declares neutrality. And among other things, that states that French nationals are not supposed to fight in the war. There are an estimated 100,000 French nationals living in the United States, according to the 1860 census. Um, and it's interesting, the attitudes or the policies taken by the Union and the Confederacy about French neutrality. The Union uh, strictly respects it. It uh, respects um, the property of French nationals. It in no way tries to, um, you know, uh, uh, in issue any kind of conscription against French or any other foreign nationals. Now, the French somewhat perversely take the exact opposite approach. Again, remember, the, um, or pardon me, the Confederacy is trying to encourage the French to join its side. But the policy it takes to the French Declaration of Neutrality runs 
counter to that, uh, they, they don't respect um, French property. Uh, indeed, they either destroy or confiscate the property of many French nationals. Um, and they actively try to uh, force uh, French nationals to serve in their army. Indeed, the, the Confederate national government tries to conscript uh, French nationals until there's this enormous outcry from France and other European capitals, and then they finally back off. But throughout the war, individual Confederate states will continue to try to intimidate French and other nationals into serving in their armed forces. Uh, next slide, please. So despite the ban on Frenchmen or French nationals joining either side of the Civil War, it's not really strictly enforced and some very prominent ones do. On the Confederate side, the most prominent is Camille Armand uh, Jules Marie, Prince de Polniac. Um, he will eventually become a major general in the Confederate army. Now he starts out as a French prince who had served in the um, French army during the Crimean War. At the end of that war, he um, um, resigns from the French army and he decides to travel the world and he ends up in the South at the beginning of the Civil War and he offers his services to the Confederacy and they put him eventually in command of a Texas brigade. Now this is kind of an odd coupling. You have Texans being commanded by a French prince and they were pretty skeptical about it. Uh, in fact, they didn't even know how to pronounce his name so they, they referred to him as Prince Polecat. Now, for those of you who may not know what a Texan means by a polecat, I will show you. John, next slide, please. Yes, a skunk. And uh, as you can see, we have the world's most famous French skunk, uh, Pepe Le Pew. And I will note that Pepe is wearing a kepe, which uh, I'm wearing as well. Uh, one of the most iconic pieces of clothing in the Civil War, both sides fought wearing kepes. Uh, those came directly, uh, were adopted directly from the French army, which had had kepes since their North Africa and Algerian campaign. So back to the previous slide, please. So Polniak uh, is not offended by being called Polcat. He thinks it rather amusing and he uses it to good effect when he takes his ma uh, men into their first battle. Uh, many accounts say that he was on horseback, he rose on his stirrups and he yelled to them, follow me, you call me Polcat, I will show you whether I am Polcat or Polniak. And he led them to victory. And from that point on, he was a very popular commander and a very successful one. He really distinguished himself um, encountering the uh, Union's Red River campaign later on in the war. Uh, toward the end of the war, he will actually go on the secret mission for the Confederates. He will run the Union naval blockade and go to France to personally intercede for the Confederate cause with Napoleon III. But unfortunately, by the time he gets to France, the war is over. Uh, but for everything he done, did for the Confederacy, he was known throughout the South as the Lafayette of the Confederacy. Uh, next slide and next slide. Now, another uh, notable Frenchman who tried to aid the Fr uh, Confederate cause was Baron de Allinger. He was a leading French financier. Uh, his interest in the, in the uh, Confederate cause was probably largely due to the fact that he married John Slidell, the Confederate envoy's daughter, who by all accounts was one of the great beauties of her time. He floated the only foreign loan ever made for the Confederacy. And the idea behind that loan is it was going to enable the Confederates to buy some uh, French built armored warships for their Navy, but it never came to anything. Um, the loan didn't do very well in the international markets. However, after the war, um, Dialinger would buy control of many Southern railroads and a branch of his family would sell in the American South. Next, please. Now for the Union, you might say they had a royal flush in terms of no royal uh, Frenchmen joining their ranks. Uh, the primary one was Prince Philippe d'Orleans, Count de Paris, 
who was actually the heir apparent to the French throne and was actually recognized by many Frenchmen as the King of France upon the death of his grandfather who had been the King of France. Unfortunately though, he's ne never officially able to get the throne. And when the second Republic under Napoleon III comes to power, he's forced into exile. But he's a very strong advocate for the cause of democracy. And he and his brother, Prince Robert, offer their services directly to President Lincoln at the outset of the Civil War. He commissions them as captains in the Union Army and puts them on the staff of Major General George McClellan, who's the commander of the Union Army of the Potomac. And they distinguish themselves with their services, uh, particularly during the Peninsula Campaign. Now, their uncle also joins the uh, Union cause. He is Francois d'Orléans, Prince de Jeanville. What's remarkable about him is he's deaf. But despite that fact, he serves as a very capable staff officer also for General McClellan. Um, he is a very accomplished artist and historian. He'll paint many uh, uh, paintings on the Civil War and he'll write extensively about it. And in addition, his son Pierre will serve as an officer in the Union Navy. Next slide, please. Now, in terms of French immigrants, they take up the call to arms. Um, and the vast majority of French immigrants are located in the North. They've settled in the North. So of the 15 to 20,000 French immigrants who fight in the Civil War, the vast majority fight for the Union. Like many um, you know, nationalities or ethnic groups at the time, at the beginning of the war, many of them gravitate to military units that are comprised mainly of their compatriots. And some of the more notable French American Union, Union units include the New York 53rd Zouaves and the New York State Militia's Enfant Perdus. Now, uh, the most famous, uh, renowned, and, and effective unit was the New York 55th God's Lafayette Regiment. And they were under the command of then Colonel Philippe. Uh, de Trauban. Um, and they fought a number of battles. And again, they distinguished themselves in the Peninsula Campaign. Now, uh, de Trauban is an interesting figure. He too was a French aristocrat. But unlike the other ones I've mentioned uh, previously, he actually became a naturalized American citizen at the beginning of the Civil War and offered his services to the Union Army. As the war goes on, because of his skill and leadership ability, he's given um, uh, bigger and bigger commands. And by the end of the war, he becomes a major general in the Union Army. Next, please. Now, um, in terms of French American Confederate units, far fewer of them, uh, far fewer French American immigrants settle in the South. Though the, those that do tend to concentrate along the coastline of Texas and in Louisiana, and uh, many of them gravitate to more urban areas such as New Orleans. Um, again, like their northern um, uh, counterparts, many of them tend to join up with French American units. Uh, the most notable are the Légion Francais and the Brigade Francais of New Orleans, the God Francais Militia, the Louisiana European Brigade, and the Louisiana French Brigade. Next, please. But one of the biggest French influences uh, during the Civil War are, are, are not made up of French nationals, immigrants, but rather a, a type of French force that gained notoriety throughout the world. And that were, they were known as the Zouaves. Um, in fact, Zouave, themed units uh, in both the North and the South became so prominent during the Civil War that one Parisian newspaper has a headline saying, Il plus des Zouaves, which means it's raining Zouaves. Zouaves were originally um, recruited by the French army among North African tribesmen who were known for their fighting skill. And they wore these very colorful outfits. As you can see from the Van Gogh painting on the upper right, they were known for having you know, bright red pantaloons and colorful jackets and, and wearing fezes. Um, and so eventually what the French army did is they created their own Zouave units made out of, made up of Frenchmen 
that would wear these uniforms and they utilized them as light infantry regiments of the French army. They were in operation all the way from the 1830s to the 1960s. Now, Zouaves really made a name for themselves during the Crimean War, which was you know, fought just a few years ahead of the Civil War. And they inspired a lot of interest, particularly in the North of the United States. And so shortly before the Civil War, in the, in the Northern part of the United States, a lot of Zouave drill teams were developed and they became kind of a popular form of entertainment. Um, one of the most uh, renowned were the U.S. Zouav Cadets of Chicago, which was formed by a Colonel Elmer Ellsworth um, just shortly before the war. Um, he is a very prominent citizen of Illinois and a close personal friend of the Lincoln's. And so when the war uh, erupts, his unit is incorporated into the Union Army. Now, very early on in the war, even before the Battle of, uh, you know, First Bull Run, uh, on May 24th, 1861, Ellsworth uh, takes his men across the Potomac and occupies um, Arl uh, Alexandria, Virginia. And as his men go into the city, he sees that there's a Confederate flag flying prominently uh, off of a major hotel in Alexandria. So he personally goes into the hotel, he rips down the flag, and as he's coming down the stairs, as you can see in the uh, painting on the lower right, he is shot by the innkeeper of the hotel and mortally wounded. The innkeeper is uh, almost immediately killed by one of Ellsworth's men. Now, some believe that the deaths of these two men constitute the first real casualties of the Civil War. Ellsworth, again, being a very prominently well-known person in the North and a close personal friend of the Lincolns becomes, again, widely regarded by many as the first martyr to the Union cause. Next slide, please. Now, um, in the South, there are some legendary uh, Zouave units, perhaps the most legendary, the Louisiana Tigers. You can see uh, they have very distinctive um, uniform with their uh, blue and white pantaloons. Um, they were also known as the Wheat Battalion. Ironically, they were initially comprised of Irishmen from the wharves of New Orleans. Um, the group would be expanded and would later uh, be made up of uh, people from 24 different nationalities, including some Frenchmen. Um, the um, unit also was, uh, had an interesting composition. Uh, a lot of it was made up of what was known as the scum of the Mississippi, but some of its members were members of high society as well. They were a very effective fighting force. Um, they played uh, what some believe is a critical uh, role in the Confederate victory at the Battle of First Bull Run. When their uh, leader, Major Wheat, was uh, 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 wounded, they came under the command of uh, Colonel Charles de Zouel, who was a very prominent French Creole. He got to see another aspect of the Louisiana Tigers, which is they were a very unruly bunch. And in order to assert his authority over them, he ultimately had to shoot one of them in the face with his pistol. But nonetheless, they would continue to uh, fight uh, very bravely for the Confederacy in almost every major battle of the uh, Eastern theater of the Civil War, including Gettysburg, where they were one of the few Confederate units that actually briefly crack the Union line. But their exploits cost them dearly of about a thousand men that made up the initial group of Louisiana Tigers, only about 373 survived the war. Next slide, please. Now, the Union site has far more Zouave units. They have about 70 to the Confederacy's 25. And some of the most famous Union Zouave units were the New York 5th Volunteer Infantry, the New York 10th National Zouaves, uh, as well as others. Now, one of the interesting aspects of the Zouaves, particularly the Northern Zouave units, is that fairly early, early on in the war, they start to adapt far different tactics than more conventional um, 
uh, regiments in terms of um, forsaking the kind of close order formations that have been part of Napoleonic warfare and going for looser formations, more reactive formations that are far more similar to modern uh, you know, infantry tactics. And it served them very well because in the age of the rifled muskets, their tactics were far better than marching shoulder to shoulder. Uh, in fact, the effectiveness of their tactics was noted um, by Union General Lou Wallace, uh, someone near and dear to our Museum of Medicine. Um, he credited their tactics uh, as, as evidenced by the 8th Missouri American Zouave Infantry as being instrumental in the Union's capture of Fort Donaldson one of the first major victories for the Union in the Western theater of the war. One last um, thing about Zouaves is, ironically, about one hour before Confederate General Lee surrenders to General Grant at Appomattox, a uh, soldier of the Fifth Corps Zouave Brigade was killed, leading many to say that among the first and the last casualties of the Civil War were Zouaves. Next, please. Now, no talk about uh, the French influence in the Civil War would be complete without talking about the Vivandiers. Uh, the Vivandiers were women who had joined the French army even before the revolutionary, the French Revolution, um, would join the French army and would provide it with all sorts of support. This included managing their supplies, uh, providing other services like cooking, sewing, laundry, but also uh, such crucial tasks as helping out in, in field hospitals or actually tending to the wounded on the battlefield. Their exploits during the uh, Crimean War inspired many in the United States, particularly in the North. So when the Civil War broke out, many Northern women decided to become their own form of Vivandiers and joined uh, Union units. Uh, these Union Vivandiers would become renowned for their courage, their dedication on the battlefield, both in tending to the wounded, and even some uh, became combatants on the battlefield. Next slide, please. And um, one of the more famous is uh, French Mary Tepe. Um, she was born Marie uh, Bros in uh, Brest, France, and she came to the United States uh, in the Philadelphia area and eventually married a tailor by the name of Bernardo Tepe. When he joins the 27th Pennsylvania Infantry at the outset of the Civil War, she, uh, against his, um, you know, uh, uh, somewhat without his permission, uh, decides to join the unit as well as a vivandier. And she uh, is renowned for uh, carrying large casks of water or whiskey on the march to give to the men um, to help them. Uh, she is with them in camp, uh, furnishing supplies and also working in the hospital. But she makes a big name for herself during the first Battle of Bull Run when she goes out and tends to the wounded and even fights aside, you know, beside the men. Um, after her husband um, betrays her following that battle, she will leave that unit, but eventually join up with the Zouaves d'Afrique, a very renowned uh, Zouave unit, uh, part of the 114th Pennsylvania Regiment. Um, she will fight alongside the soldiers at such major battles as Fredericksburg, Chancellorsville, and Gettysburg, again, fighting and offering uh, medical care to the wounded. Her courage uh, is such that she receives one of the highest honors that you could attain in the Union Army, the Kearney Cross Medal. Uh, she will continue fighting with the Union Army all the way through Grant's Overland Campaign and only leaves when her second husband's enlistment runs out at the tail end of the Civil War. When she dies in 1901, um, thousands of veterans of the Union Army of the Potomac mourn her loss. Next slide, please. Now, uh, to talk uh, about prominent French American leaders on both sides of the Civil War, for the Confederacy, it's undoubtedly General P.G.T. 
for a god. He's born to a prominent French Creole family in Louisiana. He's a West Point graduate and had served uh, with distinction in the US Army until his native state of Louisiana secedes from the Union. He is personally responsible for ordering the bombardment of Fort Sumter, which marks the start of the Civil War. He will uh, lead the Confederate forces to victory at the first major battle of the war, uh, the Battle of First Bull Run, and he will also lead Confederate forces at other major battles to varying degrees of success. But he's only one of seven Confederate officers that reached the highest rank in the Confederate um, Army, that of general. But despite that, he never really has uh, the confidence of the Confederate leadership. One of the big problems is that he has an ongoing feud with the president of the Confederacy, Jefferson Davis, that lasts throughout the war and even after the war. Next slide, please. Now, on the Union side, um, you have Rear Admiral Samuel Francis DuPont, and he is a member of the very prestigious DuPont dynasty. They're the owners of the E.I. DuPont de Mures and Company, the main suppliers of gunpowder to the Union uh, Army and other forces. He had a long distinguished career in the Navy. Uh, he served with distinction in the Mexican-American War. And at the outset of the Civil War, the Union gives him command of one of the largest US fleets ever assembled. Um, in November 1861, he wins a significant uh, victory for the Union by capturing uh, Port Royal in South Carolina. Uh, and for that victory, he, in large part, he is uh, elevated to the newly created rank of Rear Admiral. He uh, takes the lead in the development of tactics for a new type of vessel that emerges during the Civil War, a steam-powered, heavily armored ship that we call ironclads. Now, unfortunately for him, his use of ironclads in a few battles is not particularly successful. But the tactics that he pioneers will, lead, will be used later on in the war, particularly in the Western sector of the war, very successfully. So many credit him with being one of the pioneers of modern naval warfare. Um, because of his achievements, uh, DuPont Circle in Washington, DC is named in his honor. Now, while we're talking about the Navy, if we can go to the next slide, we'll talk about the fact that France is the site of one of the great battles of the Civil War. It takes place, it's known as the Battle of Cherbourg, and it takes place off the coast of Cherbourg. And it's between um, the Confederate ship, the Alabama, and the Union ship, the Kearsarge. And it's a very critical battle because the Alabama, the Confederate ship, have been terrorizing Union shipping. Uh, they destroyed more than 55 Union ships, and it was having a significant, a significant impact on the Union economy. Um, the Union Navy was dedicated to tracking the Alabama down and destroying it, but the Alabama was very successful at evading the Union Navy until in June um, of 1864, they were in, badly, in bad need of repair, and in June 11th, um, 1864, the Alabama limped into um, Cherbourg Harbor for those badly needed repairs. Now, unfortunately for the Alabama, shortly after it went into Cherbourg, a Union ship, the Kearsage, became aware that the uh, Alabama was in Cherbourg. So the uh, Kearsage waited out in international waters to pounce on the Alabama as soon as it left the harbor. Now the Confederates became aware that the Kearsage was out there. So con the Confederate government pleaded with the French to give sanctuary to the Alabama, but the French said no. They said, we're a neutral nation. The Alabama must leave within a few days. So on June the 19th, 1864, the Alabama was escorted by French warships out of the harbor to three miles off the coast of France, 
which marked the beginning of international waters and left there to do battle with the Kearsarge. Now the two ships are, look to be pretty evenly matched. So thousands of French people gather along the shore of Cherbourg um, to watch the battle. And most of them are cheering on the Alabama. They want the Alabama to win, but their cheers are to no avail because within an hour, the Kearsage sinks the Confederate ship to the bottom of the ocean. Now, uh, many military historians believe that one of the big factors in the Kearsage's victory was the quality of the gunpowder that it had been supplied by the DuPont company. It was very well manufactured and retained a lot of its potency. So when shots from the, from the Union ship, the Kearsage, hit the Confederate ship, the Alabama, they caused a lot of damage. Conversely, the Alabama had uh, gunpowder of very poor quality and many of its shots that hit the Kearsage did little or no damage. Now, I wanna point your attention to the painting on the uh, right. If it looks familiar to you, uh, there's probably a good reason. The painting called The Battle of the Kearsage in Alabama was done by one of France's great artists. Next slide. Edward Monet. He actually completed uh, the painting within a month of the battle, even though he himself never saw it. He based it on accounts of spectators, both on the shore and those who watched the battle from their boats. Uh, the painting is now on display at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Next slide. And the, and the bonds between Cherbourg and the Civil War have continued to grow. In 1984, a French warship uh, discovered the wreck of the Alabama about seven miles off the coast of Cherbourg. And following that, uh, joint US and French excavations of the site have yielded a large number of artifacts from the Alabama. One of the most important, a, a large uh, cannon from the ship is on display at a French museum in Cherbourg. And in 2004, the US uh, Civil War Preservation Trust designated Cherbourg City Cemetery as the first official overseas American Civil War site. Um, the graves of two Confederate and one Union sailor lay in a section known as the Tomb d'Alabama. Uh, I will point out, ironically, the Union sailor was not an American. He was actually a uh, British uh, national, again, showing the international character of the Civil War. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, I'd like to end with talking about uh, an enduring symbol that came out of the Civil War. Uh, as the war went on, more and more Frenchmen very strongly admire President Lincoln for his leadership ability throughout the war. This admiration extends even to those Frenchmen who are initially sympathetic to, to the Confederacy. So when he is assassinated at the war's end, it, it causes a huge outpouring of, of sympathy and sorrow among the French people from almost all walks of life. Um, French students flood the streets of, of Paris. Um, there were pledges made throughout the country to do things like present gold medals to Mrs. Lincoln to express France's sympathy and solidarity. But perhaps the most important thing that occurs is a very famed French histor historian, Edward de Lavallee, gives a speech saying that France should give a statue to the United States to honor Lincoln's memory, to celebrate French-American relations, and to promote the cause of liberty. And by saying that, it's, it's directed in part to the French desire or the desire on the part of many Frenchmen that someday liberty will return fully to France itself. His words inspire a very noted uh, French sculptor by the name of Frederick Auguste Bartoli, who will go on to create and gift to America the Statue of Liberty, which is dedicated in 1886 and remains an enduring symbol of French-American relations 
and the cause of liberty. Next slide. So in conclusion, um, I, I hope this discussion has helped you know, emphasize the strong role that France had in, in, in a lot of aspects of the Civil War, that you know, France played an enormous, uh, had an enormous influence in the way that the war was fought, that French advances in medicine helped inspire uh, the modernization of the American medical system and American battlefield medicine. Um, that French nationals, French immigrants, and French Americans played a very important role in fighting the Civil War on both sides and in leadership uh, positions on both sides. That French inspired Zouave units helped pave the way for more innovative battle tactics in uh, American armed forces. Uh, that the Vivandier uh, movement help create greater opportunities for women to serve uh, at the battlefront and created greater public awareness and appreciation for their role. Uh, that the Battle of Cherbourg illustrates the international character of the Civil War, both in terms of, it, of its scope and its impact on the rest of the world. And that, you know, the Civil War to this very day um, affects both the United States and France in many, many ways. Next slide. So I thank you very much for listening to the presentation. Um, I list some of my sources here. I highly recommend that you uh, read the book uh, listed at the top, France and the American Civil War, done by uh, a French scholar who provides a very uh, good insight into French perspectives on the Civil War. I also recommend for those who are interested in, in Civil War medicine to read the works I've listed here of uh, Robert or Bob uh, Slauson. Dr. Slauson is one of the foremost authorities on um, Civil War medicine and you know, very closely associated with the museum. I'd like to thank the assistance of, um, of um, a, a scholar by name of uh, Carrie Ainsworth. And uh, for those of you who want to know more, you know how to contact the museum. Uh, next slide, please. But if you want to contact me, here's how you can do it. And uh, again, thank you very much for listening. And one more slide. Now I'm open for questions. So thank you, John. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Brad. That was uh, fantastic. And just to one of the points you made is uh, talking about the international aspect of the Civil War. Uh, an incident that you brought up called to mind uh, for me something the Louisiana Tigers assaulting Cemetery Hill, the Battle of Gettysburg in 1863. Uh, dressed in Zouave uniforms, and they're going head to head with uh, several German units from the 11th Corps. So you have uh, at least, if not Frenchmen themselves, French inspired units going uh, fighting against German soldiers in the Union Army, uh, both abroad and even right here on American soil. The Civil War, in many ways, really was an international conflict. And, and there's a great book that speaks to that point. Uh, you know, it's not specifically French related, uh, which is, you know, why it doesn't specifically apply to this discussion, but I believe it's called The Cause of All Nations by Don Doyle. Um, that's a really, really excellent book if this whole international element uh, interests you. Uh, and I'm going to pop over the comments here. We'll uh, look at some questions and comments. Uh, I'll note too that if you joined in the middle of this and you you know, didn't catch the whole thing, or if you want a closer look at the sources page, once we finish our, our live stream here, you can go back. It'll continue to exist on the Facebook page. Eventually it'll make its way over to YouTube uh, and you can go and pause and, you know, scrutinize the PowerPoint to your heart's content and, uh, and catch anything you might've missed. So let's see here. Um, going all the way back here. Uh, let's see, we got Gary from Ellicott City, John from Florida tuning in, Rosemary from Ann Arbor, excellent. Let's see. Uh, Deidre asks, what was the feud about between Beauregard and Jefferson Davis? 
Oh, I, I think um, I'm, I'm not an expert on it, but uh, they had very differing views on how the war should be prosecuted. And I think you know, one of the initial causes was uh, uh, Jefferson Davis, I think, was um, upset at the fact that uh, the you know, Confederates uh, at the Battle of First Bull Run didn't you know, press the victory. And um, that, I think, was one of the starts of the, of the feud between him and, and Beauregard. And, and that continued and uh, got exacerbated in um, the conduct of um, other battles by, by Beauregard. Um, so I, I, I think part of it too was sort of a personality conflict as well. Yeah, that's, that's my impression as well, Brad. Uh, Denise asked, uh, by whom was the Alabama salvaged? I don't know that the ship um, was salvaged per se, but the but the artifacts were salvaged by um, a, a series of teams, a uh, joint uh, U.S. and French uh, teams. I think they're primarily done by uh, the U.S. and French navies, um, and they were done over the course of several years. And the, gotcha. and the cannon that you see in the French Museum is called a Blakesley gun, which was manufactured by the British, again, showing the international nature of the war. Yeah, you know, when you're really looking for that stuff, it, it, it's everywhere. You can't escape it. I mean, and, and it's, it's amazing. Right. You know, it's just sitting right there in, in front of our eyes. It just we need to pay attention to it right. and all that sort of thing. Um, so that I believe is is all the questions we've got here. We got a number of folks saying thanks and outstanding presentation. Uh, Lori says this was fantastic. I learned things I didn't know. Um, so thank you all for for tuning in. Uh, I'm glad to hear that so many of you enjoyed. Um, if you did enjoy the video, please consider hitting the like button uh, or the heart button and sh clicking share. Uh, spread the word. Tell your friends about it. Maybe you have some uh, French relatives or or uh, folks that are uh, French descendants. Uh, maybe send it their way. Uh, but thank you for tuning in. If you want to take your support to the next level, you can support our videos by becoming a member of the National Museum of Civil War Medicine. Uh, your membership dollars help support our mission. So uh, we would greatly appreciate it uh, if you're able to do that. Uh, until next time, uh, next week, uh, we'll be airing my interview with uh, Dr. Judy Giesberg. She's the author of Sex in the Civil War. And we're going to be talking about uh, her, uh, that, the book of the same title, Sex in the Civil War, uh, airing the week of Valentine's Day. So it should be a, a grand old time. So we'll hope to see you all uh, next week. And until then, hope you all have a great day. Au revoir.